Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, that we can stop the conveyor belt of our life for just a morning and focus on you here in this place with your people, those who call on you, who you have called out of the world and that you've made us right with you, not by anything we've done, but by everything that Jesus did for us. I thank you, Lord, that when we pray, you hear us, not on behalf of our own goodness, because we don't have any, but on the perfection of your Son, who sacrificed his life for us. I pray that you help us to know more about that, that you might help us to grow in it, and Lord, that we might appropriate it for ourselves. As we read your word, Lord, I pray that you might form us more into your image, that we would look more the way you would have us to look, and that we might shed things in our lives that we even ourselves despise. So, Lord, we place ourselves before you in your hands. Pray your spirit move in our hearts and minds, and that you make us more like Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> Previously, we're in 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're still in 1 Peter chapter 4. So what was previous is still happening. First Peter basically talking about suffering, how to handle suffering, the question of why we suffer, the advantages that come out of it, how a Christian is to behave in relationship to suffering. And so we've been looking through all of that. First um, Peter 4.1 says, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So there's this sense in which not Jesus didn't come to suffer so we don't have to. He came to suffer to show us how it's done. And that's not really a doctrine that, you know, people uh, espouse and enjoy and champion and, you know, get tattoos for. And, you know, it's not one of those things because we don't like to hear that. Uh, most people try to endeavor to spend their life not suffering in any way, shape or form. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You guys enjoy pain? Yeah, I didn't think so. Uh, that's what I thought. But we try to avoid that at all costs, right? If, if something causes us to even be uncomfortable, we will try to avoid it. That's why personal interaction is so difficult with people, because they don't like conflict. Did you not know that? <laughs> yeah, personal conflict. Most people don't like to face off with other people. And so we try to avoid that. And here it says Jesus suffered in such a way that we should have the same mind as him. And being a Christian, that's what we do. We follow in the footsteps of Jesus. So it's not just, yeah, I got my golden ticket. It's I'm going to live like Jesus because he showed me how to live. It includes suffering. We talked about Christ having suffered and how we're to view our afflictions and our difficulties as light and momentary because that's what the scripture says they are. And if you look at a timeline of eternity past and eternity future, whatever it is we're going through isn't even a speck on the timeline, right? But sometimes we get so focused on it, that's all we can think about is what's hurting me today or the thing I'm struggling with today. And we think that's it. That's our whole life because we look at it so closely. It's like looking at a penny and a penny doesn't seem like much and certainly doesn't buy anything, but it's bigger than the sun. If you hold it this close and close one eye and suddenly something very small can become gigantic and blot out the sun. So viewing our suffering as something that's light and momentary is one of those things that we're supposed to do. And we're supposed to arm ourselves because it's not something that lasts forever. And so whatever difficulty and hardship you go through, uh, when I go to the gym, uh, it's like, oh, I, don't, I gotta go to the gym. Then I feel like I have to get it done first thing in the morning or if my day gets away from me, I can't get there. And I, oh, I gotta go to the gym. I don't wanna do it. I'm just gonna be flat out honest with you. I'm fat, I'm old, and I don't wanna go to the gym. <laughs> And so when I go, it's like, okay, all right, I'm here. I got the funny clothes on. Let me just get it done, you know. And then in the middle of it, I figure, you know, it, it's going to end at some point soon. <laughs> so just keep going. And I have a workout that I go through and you know, all these, you know, different machines and hopefully they're available. And, and then when it's over, I'm like, I'm glad I did that. 
But if it wasn't looking forward to it that it's going to end, I'm not sure I would even go. I'd be like, I don't even want to, you know. But it's small, it's temporary, and it's one of those things that will have an end. And so I will suffer for a while, but hopefully I won't die of heart disease as quickly or diabetes ever, I would hope. So Christ suffered, so we learn to suffer that way by looking at it on the timeline of eternity and understanding that it only has, it's got a shelf life. It's not going to be forever. And God uses it to make us like him. And we have to defend ourselves and arm ourselves with this mind as was in Christ Jesus, which is also in Philippians chapter two, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what did he do? He humbled himself. He came from heaven and he humbled himself being found in the formation of a man in the form of a man, which, which has all the indignities of being a human being. I mean, Jesus had to become human. He was really 100% human like you and I, and yet very God. I don't ask me to understand it because I'm not God. I'm just a person. But he had to have all the indignities. He had to eat. God doesn't eat. He had to use the facilities. He had to handle temptation in his face. He had desires that he had never had before in the flesh. And so he was human. He had to battle those things like you and I do. And because of that, he becomes eligible to be the guy to lead us because he went through it perfectly. So Jesus has the mind that I need to have. So I need to have the same mind that's in Christ Jesus. That's why I read the word of God, right? Amen. Amen. We have this same mind and we seek those things that are above because the things that are here on earth are temporary. Mm -hmm. The things that we'd get all involved in here, they're temporary. And in fact, there were things that were once part of our present that are no longer part of our present. They're now in the past. Today will be one of those things. Today will go away and it will just be a memory and it'll be behind you, right? And we can get so fixated on the things of today and of this earth we, we can just get overwhelmed with it. And it says that the one who has done this, has suffered in the flesh, has ceased from sin. There's a sense in which when you focus yourself on doing what God would have you do, there isn't room in your life to be getting involved in the stupid things you would otherwise do. Make sense? It's kind of like having a job. You got a job. You're occupied between 8 and 16 hours, depending on what kind of job you have. And you, that, you, you got to get this thing done, right? You're not going to be roaming the street looking for trouble. Right? right. Okay, good. I'm glad you agree. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little uh, feeling alone here. So you concentrate on being who God wants you to do. And when that happens, there, there just isn't room for you to do the stupid things you would otherwise do. And so we get filled with the spirit of God. We get on task. We get on point and we do those things that please him. And we don't, get involved in the things we wouldn't. It says if you do, there are certain things that you do in 2 Peter 1.10, if you want to read up previous to that, there are certain things that if we do, and if we're focused on the Lord, it says if we do these things, we will never stumble. How would you guys like a recipe to how to never stumble? I, I would. I mean, spiritually, I don't want to stumble and fall and everything. And there are reasons why it happens. A lot of it is because I don't, I don't care for my spirit in such a way. And I get emaciated and I fill up with things. It's like, if you don't eat for a while and you got Twinkies in the house, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> you get it. So if you fill up with the good stuff, you won't want the junk. That's the thing. They brought them back. Did you know that? I'm surprised they're legal. <laughs> Galatians 5.16, it says that we should walk in the spirit and we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're busy about the Lord's business, you won't be doing the, the monkey business you would otherwise be doing. And so what we do is for the rest of our lives, we're going to do that which pleases the Lord. And we, we don't live our life according to our own dictates of what we want because we don't belong to ourselves. We do that which the Lord would have us do. We live for the will of God. It's something that Jesus did and demonstrated with deep sacrifice. And it's something that we're told to do when we pray, right? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. Not my will, but thy will be done. And that's something Jesus, when asked how to pray, he says, pray this way. 
He, he didn't say pray this exact prayer word for word, and he certainly didn't mean at high speed like most people do. Our Father, we're in heaven, I live in the Amen. That's not a prayer, that's a recitation of something that you have memorized. But our Father, notice his first identity has to do with all of us, not just you. Our Father. And you, we're, to, we're to think about every one of those things. Not my, it's thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which means I need to be part of doing God's will here on the earth, which means I have to submit my heart to his plan. And so that's what we do. When we do that, we don't get involved in the things that we shouldn't be doing either. For we have spent long enough in our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles. Don't you think we've spent enough time doing stupid things? Yeah. Lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, which is just going out and, and hanging out and looking for trouble. You guys know what that's like, right? I know. I could tell. <laughs> Drinking parties, you know, you know, a pong, whatever. Drinking parties where alcohol is basically worshipped like Bacchus were real. Abominable idolatries. When something is worshipped in place of God instead of God being God, that's called idolatry. And there are lots of people who idolatrize all sorts of things. You can, you can do that with a person. You can do that with your money. You can do that with your car. You could do that with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You could do that to your own children and put them up to the place where they are. They tell you what to do and you do it. Uh, and there's no exception. That's a terrible life. And children will become criminals that way. So, he says, in, in regard to these things, they think it's strange you don't run with them into the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. You know, when, when I became a Christian and I told my friends about Jesus, they thought something wrong, was wrong with me. Mm. Something's wrong with you. You must have joined, joined a cult. You're not getting high, doing coke, doing speed, beating people up anymore. You're not breaking into houses with us. Something wrong with you. Does that logic even fly, you know, and they'll look at you like there's something wrong with you because listen, I want to live for God. I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to live the way Jesus tells me to live because it's the most fruitful and the most joyous life to live. Amen. Amen. And so I'm going to submit myself to his rules. <laughs> the gospel is preached to those who are now dead so that they have a choice so that they might be able to live according to the spirit and, and, and not the flesh. And so there are people that have gone before us who have lived this life, and it's a historic thing. Jesus says, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. You know, some, sometimes, we're, sometimes we pray, but we're not watchful. Sometimes we're watchful, but we don't pray. If you turn on the TV and you just get your, you know, your daily dose of CNN or Fox News or uh, CNBC or whatever it is that's coming in, I mean, you can be watchful and you can know what's going on, like uh, what's happening in, Af in Afghanistan and Iran and Gaza. You know, you can look at all and you can be watchful. But if you don't pray, you'll also be worried. But we can pray and be watchful. And those two things together are the right combination. Uh, you don't just pray about it and not be watchful because you won't know what to pray for. Right? And that's exactly what Jesus told his disciples when he went to pray when in, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was tempted to the point of uh, uh, sweating drops of blood. He said, hey guys, just stay up with me and pray with me. And three times he had to come back and wake them up. You guys sleeping? You, you, you all good? You, you got your naps in? That's good. Well, my betrayers here and it's over and that was the that was the last time they spent time with Jesus and they missed it because they were asleep so be watchful and pray above all have fervent love for one another I defined that word fervent when I looked up the original word it means to be stretched out stretched out like stretch Armstrong uh, I, some of you young people have no idea what I'm talking about. It's this real squishy dude that, that was a toy way back when. And you could stretch him out. And it says that we're supposed to, above all things, have fervent love, stretched out love for one another. Y you know what it is when you're loving somebody to the place where you're stretched out? None of you go that far, huh? Okay. <laughs> when it's actually hard for you to do something that somebody would like you to do, you get stretched out. You, you, 
Don't you, what's wrong with you people? When you love somebody so much, it hurts. When you have to go and tell your kid, no, you can't do that thing because it's bad for you, you get stretched out. You, you know what I'm talking about. When you know you have to go talk to that person that, you know, they're doing something they shouldn't be doing and you got to go tell them and you don't want to tell them and so you're praying about it or, or procrastinating, whichever you think it might be. And then you actually have to go and do it. It hurts to do the right thing. It hurts, it hurts to say no. It hurts to tell people, hey, you got to stop doing this stupid thing. It hurts. And what we do is we stretch ourselves out. Somebody says, hey, can I borrow something from you? And you're like, um... I kind of need it, but yeah, okay. You know what it is when you're stretched. That's the way we're supposed to love. It's supposed to be a stretch. It's supposed to be hard. In fact, the harder it is, I think that's how you measure the love. Anyway, I just, just got lost in my own thoughts there for a minute. Sorry. So. Be fervent in love for one another. And by the way, that's not just in the confines of marriage or a family. It means one another in the body of Christ, in, in the church. And for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Jesus ultimately was the one who fervently loved us, and he stretched out his arms and he died. And so he shows us to what extent we should be loving each other and, and stretching out. We talked about covering something in love and talked about Noah when he was in his tent and he was drunk and his son walked in and found him naked on the floor and he laughed. And then he went and told his brothers, hey, dad's all drunk in his tent. And the brothers went and took a blanket, put it over their back and they walked in and covered him up and they wouldn't look at their dad in that state. That's a great example of what it is to cover somebody in love. It means you forgive, you forget. You don't mention it. You don't think about it. You don't discuss it. You don't go, did you hear what Pastor Dave did? <laughs> Stuff like that. You cover it in love. And it's like, you know what? Just forgive. Forget about it. Let it go. Why bring it up? Well, because they need to know. Do you think they don't? No, they know, but they need to know from me. Oh, in your own inimitable way you're going to cut them down. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Why don't you just cover it in love? No, I have to talk to everyone about every little thing. In fact, as soon as Pastor Dave is done, I'm going to tell him about that shirt. <laughs> Sometimes we say things because we feel like, well, I'm just saying. I got to say it. No, you don't. You have to say anything. Let it die. Let it die. Like a fish you caught that you want to cook. Cut the head off and throw it away. Throw the head away and forget it ever happened. And cover. You want to cover people. Also, being hospitable to one another means to be a lover of strangers. A lover of strangers. That means you have a magnetism to those who are stranger. And some of them are stranger than others. <laughs> But you have, you have this draw to, to get involved with strangers, to help strangers, to, to encourage them, to find out what their needs are and be involved in their life. Most of us, it's like, you know, I got this wall. I got, I got three friends. That's it. Or maybe one part-time friend. And we tend to get very segmented. And unfortunately, our world is such that, you know, you could park yourself in front of a computer screen or put yourself in a car or put yourself in a cubicle at work and you can segment the rest of the world off and you don't have to be open, honest, transparent, accountable. You don't have to be any of that. You could have your own secret twisted life all by yourself. But when you reach out and get involved in other people's life, you really risk being hurt, don't you? How many of you reached out to show somebody love and got hurt? It's a pretty universal thing. Those people never got hurt over there. That's exciting. Well, it's coming. It's coming. It'll happen. You, you trust people and they're going to hurt you. Guess what? Jesus forgave me of all of my sins. So I can forgive you. Whatever little thing it is that you've done to me, certainly I should be able to erase that or eradicate that. So this week... We're going to get deeper into it. We're going to be in First Peter 4, picking it up from verse 10. Peter going on, to each one has received a gift. 
Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies. And in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, it begins by saying, each one of you has received a gift. If you look under your chair right now, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not that kind of gift. The scripture teaches that when you come and you ask the Lord to come into your life and you say, I realize that Jesus is who he said he is. I'm going to accept him as my Lord and my Savior. I believe in him and his, and his bodily death and resurrection and I'm going to give him my life, and I'm going to follow uh, everything he tells me to do, because I believe that he's the Son of God. When that happens, it says that God does something interesting. He sends his Holy Spirit to us, and he actually resides inside of our body. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? you got a nuclear-powered conscience now, and suddenly things bother you, even about your own life, and you're like, you know, i got to stop doing this. This is really a bad thing I do. I never felt bad about it before, but you know, I do now. And the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to speak. And he, one of his jobs is to remind us of everything that Jesus has spoken. But one of the other things happens is he gives you a gift. A gift? That's right, just for showing up. And that's not all. The gift is something more than just one. Some people have multiple gifts. For instance, I would not want to go to a church that had somebody speaking that couldn't speak. That would be tough, right? Or couldn't rational, rationalize or be able to instruct in a way that you'd understand. Nobody wants to go to that guy's church, right? H have you ever been to a place where you're like, my dear beloved, thank you for playing I've been there. That's why I'm not like that. <laughs> because it's misery. I'd rather go to the dentist. It says that as each one has received a gift, by the way, I want you to notice it says each one has received a gift. So if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your savior, you got a gift. You know why he gave you that gift? To give it away. It's re-gifting. Christmas is coming, people. And if you get a gift that you can't use, what do you do? You give it away. That's right. To somebody, hopefully, that needs it, likes it, wants it, you know, it uh, doesn't know the person that gave it to you. Because you get caught doing that, and that's like really bad news, right? <laughs> each one has a gift. It says, as each one has received a gift, it's assumed that you guys all understand this, that everybody has a gift, that when you accepted Jesus Christ, God put something in you that you do better than anybody else, maybe that you do uniquely, that you are a puzzle piece that fits into a puzzle. You guys get this, right? Okay, good, because i got to move on. Each one has received a gift. In Timothy, it says something interesting about these gifts. If you go to uh, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, Romans 12, or Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, it talks about these various gifts. It's not all encompassing. Each one of those passages has some outliers that, that aren't in the others. But it's really interesting to see the kind of gifts that God gives. And we learn some things as we go through the scripture about the administration of these gifts. Number one, I want you to know that you, you should not neglect the gift. Do you know you can neglect a gift? God can give you something just like the parable of the talents where you bury it and you just, you just put it in the ground. Well, that's going to be a sad thing when you face the Lord because you didn't do anything with what he gave you. If, I mean, imagine somebody gave you like an awesome, awesome thing and then you just put it in your closet in the box. It's so much worse than that because you don't benefit yourself with this gift. You benefit other people with this gift. God has gifted you to give something away to someone else. And it can be neglected. Timothy, young pastor Timothy, was told by Paul not to neglect the gift of God which has been given to you. In Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, it says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. In other words, when you get saved and you give your life to Jesus and he gives his life for you, something changes in you and you're gifted and that's it. That's the thing God wants you to do. 
And you might say, well, I don't want to do it. Well, the funny thing is, you're going to find yourself doing it everywhere you go. And you can have a, it can go well for you or it could go very hard. Right? If I was to say, okay, God, you, you made me to be a pastor and a public speaker. I ain't doing it. I'd rather do garbage because nobody criticizes me. Ooh. Anybody who teaches, they set themselves up as a target. You know that? Yeah, I look forward to your comments later. So, <laughs> they're irrevocable. In other words, God selects you to be a puzzle piece, and that's the puzzle piece you are. And he won't take it away. So you shouldn't run away, and you shouldn't neglect it. You should stand up and do it, because there's such joy in serving the Lord in ways that you can uniquely serve him that benefit other people. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's like Christmas on steroids. It's like supercharged Christmas. Maybe you don't know what steroids are. <laughs> the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Each one has received a gift. And notice here, it says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. That's a speaking gift, by the way. There are two classifications in the scriptures for gifts. You either have a speaking gift or a serving gift. Mm -hmm. How many of you didn't know that? Didn't know that. The categories. There's two categories. Evangelism, speaking gift. Pastor, speaking gift. Prophet, speaking gift. Teacher, speaking gift. Service, it's a ministry gift, right? Giving, it's a ministry gift. They, they trust me, go through, and they fall into one of two categories. You're either going to be serving or you're going to be speaking. They're two different types of gifts. And you're going to, have, you're going to fall on one side or the other. And then the beautiful thing is, as you mature and as you learn more about who Christ is and you, you're with people, you will find that you begin to mature into all of those areas. I mean, I, I can preach a sermon and go empty garbage. I could do that. I know how to do it. And I know that there are extra bags in the can because I put them there. <laughs> So you'll notice these two categories. You either have a speaking gift or a ministry gift. And the funny thing is, uh, normally they, they, they don't go between. You have a guy like Stephen, who's one of my heroes from the Bible. Stephen was a deacon, but that man could preach. You listen to a sermon there in the, in the book of Acts, it's off the charts. But anyway, so you're going to have one of these two different types of gifts. And the gift is given so that you might re-gift it to somebody else, like handing off the baton to someone else. So your gift isn't for you, which is somewhat unique, isn't it? Usually you give a gift for somebody else. But it's like you're giving a gift for them to give to everyone else. And that's the way God is with us. So whatever gift it is that you have, it's meant to be put to work in, in the service of the Lord for other people. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So... I'm, I'm sharing with you what God has given me in the hours of study in the office. And it's like that. So what has God given you? What's in your wallet? <laughs> A remarkable thing happens when Jesus, Jesus goes home to Nazareth and he preaches a sermon and everybody hates him because they say, isn't this the carpenter's son? Who's this guy? How's, where'd he get all these words? They were amazed at his speech and his speaking ability and his teaching ability. But he read to them a prophecy from Isaiah, and he said, it's fulfilled in your hearing, and they got a little upset, and then they wanted to kill him. And so the, the crowd backed him over to a cliff and tried to get rid of him. But after he just walks through, he said something probably very profound, and he just walked away, and they left him alone. They ended up going to Peter's house for lunch. And, you know, ladies, I don't know if you've ever had your husband come home with 12 friends for lunch. Um, but Peter then is there heading to Peter's house. They get to his house. His mother-in-law is sick, which means Peter's married. Because you don't have an in-law without that, right? So Peter goes home and his mother-in-law is sick, and they're all there for lunch. That's a problem because guess who's making lunch? Mother the mother-in-law. That's right. She's the only one that seems to know how to cook in the house. So... Uh, they come up to Jesus and they say, well, we got a, we got a little problem. Uh, 
uh, we, we weren't thinking that you and all your disciples are going to show up and our mother-in-law sick. So, um, Jesus, you think you could help us out here? And Jesus goes and he finds her all sweated up and nasty. And you know what it is when you're sick and you're all sweated up and nasty? What you don't want is a visitor. And Jesus walks in and he touches her and heals her. Boom. The first thing she does is she jumps to her feet and she makes lunch. You know why? Because she had a ministry gift. And when Jesus does something for you, you naturally want to do something for somebody else. You just do. I mean, it's that way. Luke 9.39 spells it out this way. So he stood over her and he rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she arose and served him. Because that's what happens when the Lord gives to us. It, you you want to give to others, don't you? And so that's why it's important to note that God gives gifts to every single person. They're irrevocable. They can be neglected, but you shouldn't neglect them. And when you put those things to use, it's going to bring you joy when you do that. And so you want to hand off. As each one has received a gift, minister like Jesus did. Now, see, Jesus says this to his disciples in Matthew 10, 8. He tells them, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. I find a principle. It's not something you earn, by the way. God didn't, I think God made me a pastor because I'm just so messed up that you guys know when I speak and stuff resonates in your heart, it's not me. Right? You get that. I'm just as big a bonehead as you are, and I think you know that. But God's word and God's spirit works. And I, th and I think that's a fantastic thing. So I'm, I'm blessed. To, to do, this is the best job I've ever had, by the way. You people are the, the least lively audience I've ever seen. But <laughs> freely you have received, freely given. And that's the way we should be, right? We should be giving because we've received. It's like a full glass. If you have a glass that's full and somebody's glass is empty, boy, it's, it's, it's easy for me to pour into your glass. But if my glass is empty and your glass is empty, we're just going to stand and complain, right? Right? So when the Lord fills us up and he gives freely, he doesn't charge us and he doesn't say, oh, well, you better be, you better be good for goodness sake. You know, he knows if you've been sleeping, it's not like that at all. He gives it so we can give it away. And we see Jesus doing both speaking gifts as he was teaching his disciples and also serving. If you remember at the last supper, at the Passover meal that Jesus was there and Nobody washed their feet, and nobody washed, you know, their own feet. The men, as they can be, come tromping in off the dirt road. They flop off their sandals wherever they fall, and they go to the dinner table with dirty feet. Now, you might not think that matters much, but if your table's only this high and everyone's laying on pillows and your buddy's feet are right next to your plate, that's going to be a big deal. <laughs> So what Jesus did is after the meal, as he went away and he took off his outer garment and he put a towel around his waist and he got a basin of water and he went around and washed the feet of every one of his disciples. After dinner, what does that tell you? Nobody, it's like, it's like those three people, you know, everybody, nobody, and somebody, you know. Everybody thought somebody should do it. And somebody thought everybody should do it. But nobody did it. And so this thing got left done until after the dinner. And Jesus went around and washed all their feet, came to Peter, and, and Peter had the sense to say, you're not washing my feet. No way. Because he knew who Jesus was. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said it earlier. And he thought maybe Jesus was going to give him an attaboy. There you go. <laughs> but Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. He goes, what I'm doing right now, you don't understand. But you will. And so Peter said, okay, well, give me a bath. I'll, 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 head to toe. Let me strip down now, Lord. Peter, calm down. <laughs> Peter was given to extremes. Calm down. 
Only your feet need to be washed. And then he says, you are already clean because of the word that I spoke to you. You see, Jesus is weaving in a spiritual lesson. I've spoken to you the word and you understand the truth. That makes you clean, except you need your feet washed. You know, don't we need our feet washed? I mean, in the spiritual sense, we all need our feet washed every day, all the time. I need the Lord to straighten out my thinking about this, that, or the other thing. And Jesus went around and he served and washed their feet. For those of you who have a, a, a ministry gift, here's what Ecclesiastes 9.10 says. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might or with all your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. It's Ecclesiastes, okay? It's, it, it's kind of a, a downer book if you read it. It's an old man at the end of his life looking back and saying, I wasted my life on a bunch of stuff. It's a good book to read. If you want to employ your life today to do something well, you got to wade through all of the regrets of somebody telling you. And here in Ecclesiastes, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Like, do it like you mean it. Like, worship from your heart. Serve hard. Work hard. Work hard? Yeah, work hard. Because you know what? There's coming a time where no one's going to be able to work i got to clean out my garage. I'll tell you what, when I clean that garage out, that garage is clean. I mean, the floor does not have a speck. And this is my garage, where I have a motorcycle and tools and sawdust and screws everywhere. Screws are all put away. Sawdust is all cleaned up. Everything's organized and labeled as soon as I get in there. But when I get in there, it's going to be clean. You know, you're going to open that door and go, wow, I can find everything in here. This is better than Home Depot. <laughs> Whatever your hand finds to do. So what is it that the Lord has led you to do? What has he gifted you to do? What unique situation he's, has he put you in for you to employ the gift for him? Whatever it is, whether it's speaking and teaching, encouraging, strengthening other people, or if it's going to be a serving gift in some way, shape, or form, do it from your heart. Do it because you're doing it for the Lord, right? Because when we're dead, there'll be no more of it. There's only so much we're going to do, and then pfft, there's a deadline. And it, there's, I won't be able to go do my garage. I won't be able to go do anything. I won't be able to speak to anybody, teach anybody anything, because I'll be done. So I should do it with my heart today. I'm, I'm preaching to myself. Sorry. <laughs> Verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial in which is to try you. By the way, he's writing to a bunch of people who are having to die for their faith. They're being persecuted as Christians to death. As though some strange thing were happening to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory is revealed, that you may also be glad with exceeding joy. You see, when you're suffering because you're a bonehead, that's one thing. When you're suffering for Christ, it should be a glory. It should be something that we're like, thank you, sir, may I have another? It should be one of those things where we're not suffering like, woe is me. What's the matter? Oh, somebody made fun of me, or they gave me a face. Really? That takes you out? That takes your legs out? Where's the joy? Where's the joy? And you know what? They're persecuting me the way they persecuted Christ. Guess what? I'm on the right team. It means you're on the right team, and that's what it should be. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So the question is, if I'm not suffering any persecution, is there something wrong with me? Am I not sharing Christ in such a way that warrants people to tell me to shut up? I think there's a way you can do it where people just tell you to shut up anyway. But do they tell me to shut up based on content, not on delivery? Anyway. Yeah, and that's fearful for some people. You know, if I'm going to live, if I'm going to live godly for, for the Lord, you know, I'm going to offend some people. I'm, if I tell them, listen, you, 
You need to get right with God. You need to get your relationship with him straight because you're not living the way he wants you to. He didn't create you to do what you're doing. You, you tell that to people and you, you risk a relationship, right? Unless you love them. Unless you love the Lord. And unless you love them. Because it's better, it's better for both. Matthew 24, Jesus talking about the end times and, and things that will happen. He says, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. <laughs> and then many will be offended. And notice not everyone will be, but many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. So Jesus talking about this kind of descent of what's happening, I'm sure that in the future there will be a time when church will be outlawed. Meeting in a building and researching the scriptures and worshiping God is going to be something that is not just looked upon, but it will be punishable. In fact, much of the scripture is now labeled hate speech. And those who label it such know nothing of what the scripture says. It's coming a time when people will have to retreat into their homes and will have secret churches like they do in China. It's not surprising, and we shouldn't be amazed that it happens. Some very good examples of a fiery trial would be Daniel. Daniel, a Jewish boy taken from Jerusalem, made to march 700 miles to Babylon, and he was made a slave one of the first things they do is they neuter you, they change your sexuality, and they put you into service because you're wandering around the king's wives, and they don't want anything happening where you propagate your species. And so here's Daniel, and he serves King Nebuchadnezzar very faithfully. And you get guys that scheme against him and say, this guy, Daniel, he's, everything he does is successful, and he serves that God, you know. So they want to get him in trouble, and they know they won't get him in trouble for anything immoral, so they, they get the king to make a law that nobody should pray to anyone but him, the king. And they say, for sure, Daniel's going to mess this up, because every single morning and night, he opens the windows and he prays. We're going to have to snag him in what he does. Guess what? They caught him praying. <laughs> And the king reluctantly had to throw him in the lion's den. He left him there overnight and came in the morning and he cried out to Daniel and said, Daniel, has your God delivered you? And Daniel said, yep, yep. we're all good. <laughs> the Lord preserved him in the lion's den. And the king realized he had been had. And he took all of his advisors who made this law and threw them in, and immediately they were chewed up to pieces. That's what it is to endure trial. Trusting God as a great creator, as the one who's in charge of all things, and going through a fiery trial. It's by trusting in the Lord. If you remember his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his friends would not bow down to this giant statue that he had made of himself. And so he said, I'm going to throw you in the fire. And they said, okay, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down and worship that image, O king. So they were very respectful, but they drew a very hearty line of what they wouldn't do. They got thrown in the fire. It was 10 times hotter, and anybody that was stoked in the furnace got killed by getting close to it. And they put these guys in. And it's interesting, because the king looked, and he saw four in the fire when only three were put in. And he goes, and the one looks like the Son of Man. 
And then he called out and he asked them to come out. They came out. They didn't even smell like fire. Not one bit of hair was burned on their head. The only thing that burned were the ropes that bound them. When trials come and difficulties hit us and we're going to trust in the Lord, the only thing that's going to burn off is the stuff that holds you down. Amen. That's what God does. They didn't bow, they didn't bend, and they didn't burn <laughs> because the Lord preserved them. That's what it is to go through a fiery trial with the Lord. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of of the glory of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. I heard a pastor say one time, he says, every time I hear somebody use Jesus' name in vain, I smile. And I was like, oh? You know why? They never mention Buddha. <laughs> Confucius is never cursed. Muhammad is never cursed. Allah is never cursed. It's always Jesus Christ. You notice that? Mm -hmm. yep. That's what makes him smile. Because if you really want to curse God, that's the name. <laughs> and they know better. Even if they don't know they know better. They do. I just think it's amazing. It says that when we're persecuted for Christ, that this glory of God is upon us. Now, you might not notice it at the moment because you're in the midst of something. But the glory of God is on you. I think about Stephen in, in the book of Acts when he's preaching to them. It says that they looked at him and his face was like the face of an angel. I mean, I don't think he had collagen treatments or anything. I, I think the glory of God was upon him because when he spoke under the spirit of God, he spoke this awesome sermon. They ended up killing him for it. But when he looked up, he says, I see the heavens open wide. I see... Jesus on the right hand of the Father standing. Well, by the way, almost all the time you see Jesus sitting. Mm -hmm. You know why he was standing? He was standing to receive him. And I have, I have a feeling it was a standing applause. And they stoned him to death, and that was the end of Stephen. But the glory of God was upon him in that midst. It gave him the strength to be able to speak the true words that he spoke and God was able to welcome him into heaven. And I think that's a wonderful thing. I think about Peter. If you remember, I'm sorry, Paul rather. Paul in the book of Acts, he was on a trip. He was actually going before Caesar to be tried for being a Christian. And the boat uh, got caught in some waves and some wind and it was a giant storm and they were going under. And what happened was they got dashed against the rocks up onto an island and so all of these prisoners and all of these Romans are now vomited out onto the shore. And of course, the Romans all have their swords out waiting for a prison break. Okay, which one of you is going to run first? And Paul walks away and he starts collecting wood to make a fire because everybody's wet. The first thing he thinks is, you know, you guys got to get warm, so let's make a fire. You're a prisoner of the Roman army. You don't see this as deliverance? <laughs> like God just gave you an opportunity to run away, you know? He didn't do that. He started gathering wood to make a fire so everybody could ke be kept warm. The people of the, of the town in that area came and saw what happened, and they said, oh, God must be really mad at you, but you just barely escaped with your lives. God must be really, really upset with you to allow this to happen. In the middle of picking up sticks and making a fire... Paul gets bit by a poisonous viper. <laughs> they look on and they go, oh, see, God caught up with you. You know, you did, the, the sea didn't get you, but, you know, he brought a viper. Now that viper's going to, we're just going to stand here and watch you swell up. That's what they did, because that's what happens when you get a neurotoxin. And, and you just swell up and eventually your nerves give out and you can't breathe and you just fall over dead. And so they said, yep, we know, these, we know these vipers from around here, so we're just going to watch. This is like TV. <laughs> and he shook the viper off into the fire. And they waited, and nothing happened. And they said, you must be a god. <laughs> you want to talk about being given to extremes. 
Not, not just was God going to kill you because, you know, you must have done something really bad. But now, oh, you must be God because these things kill every single time they bite. So I'm sure Paul straightened him out and told him the gospel. It's the glory and power of God that rests on somebody who's being a witness for Jesus Christ. It is a supernatural covering of the Holy Spirit. Put it to the test and see if God won't do that for you. I see Jesus as he was on the cross being the best example of what it is to have grace under pressure. He prays, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus from the cross against his perpetrators. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Thinking about his mother and looking at John and saying, behold, your mother. And looking at, at Mary and saying, behold, your son. Giving Mary into the charge of John so that John would take care of her. Kind of like the only thing that he had was a relative, which was his mom. And he gave her away at the end to make sure she was taken care of because his brothers would do a terrible job. So Jesus under pressure does that. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. I'm going to play Sesame Street for a minute. You notice one of those things that doesn't seem to belong with the others? Murder, thief, evildoer, busybody. By the way, they're all in the same category. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. You know, bzzz. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. So if you're suffering because of something you did or because you're just weird, you deserve it, Right? But if you suffer as a Christian because you stand for the things of Christ and somebody's going to mock that, you're blessed. You're blessed. It's funny, I don't feel that all the time, but it's true. And if you look for it, you'll find it. James tells us in James chapter 1, My brethren, count all joy whenever you enter into trials of many kinds. Have joy whenever things are hard. Yeah, you, you got that, right? That's easy. Count it all joy whenever you f face trials, various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. If I go out in my car and start, it's like, oh, look at that. I'm getting patient. <laughs> but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, don't pray for it to stop. Pray that it has its lesson in you so you don't have to repeat it. If any of you lacks wisdom in the middle of all of this, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. It doesn't matter if you've been a, boy, a good boy or a good girl. If you want wisdom and you want to know something, it says ask God and he'll tell you. Not based upon your perfection or your goodness. I'm glad, because I would never hear anything. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So if you're really going to ask God for wisdom, you better ask him with confidence that you believe what the scripture says, that he's going to answer you. Because if you don't really believe God's going to answer you, you say, hey, God, could you help me out here? He probably won't. Then don't expect he will. You see how that works? It's like my son walks up and says, hey, Dad, I... Uh, I need $20. Okay. So what are you going to do about that? Well, I was wondering if you had $20. Let me see. Yeah, I got $20. What's your point? That whole passive-aggressive thing, I'm not going to buy. Well, I was wondering if you could give it to you. Give it to you. Give it to you. I'll tell you what. If I give you a job, I'll pay you $20 for the job. Oh, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> we have to know that God is a good God and that he loves us. Amen. If he sent his only son to die for us, won't he give us all other things? It says in chapter 8 of Romans. Of course he will. But we need to ask him, understanding that he's a good father. 
For the time has come for judgment to begin with the house of God. Oh, what a comforting passage that is. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Judgment begins with the house of God. And Jesus demonstrates this very well in Matthew and Luke 19.45 when he goes into the temple and there they've got a whole festival going on and there's people making money and there's people extorting other people and they've turned God's house of prayer into a den of thieves. And he goes in and he just goes crazy. He starts turning over tables and he's whipping the animals out and he's overturning the tables of the money changers and he says, this is my father's house. It's supposed to be a house of prayer and you've turned it into a den of thieves. And he cleaned the temple out. Well, you know, God does the same thing with his church. He's going to make sure we're pure and sanctified and given over to him before the world is judged. We're going to get judged. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he went into the temple. So... <coughs> I hope God is in the midst of entering into your temple and cleaning you out because that's standard procedure for a Christian. Psalm 119, 66 to 67, verse 71, 75, and 76. I, I picked them all out because I didn't have enough room. <laughs> Teach me good judgment and knowledge. This is David praying. For I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. You know, when difficulty comes into our lives, it's because God loves us. He's not punishing us, per se. He's training us. You only have that if you're his kid. If you're not his kid, you don't have that. When I was, when I was afflicted, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. So there's something about going through difficult times that on the other side, you learn something about who God is. At least that's the way it's supposed to be. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. You see, when we are afflicted, it teaches us to love God, and it draws us closer to him. Verse 75, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let, I pray, your merciful kindness be for my comfort according to your word to your servant. There's this sense in which when you've been through some stuff, you know some stuff, and you're able to hand that off to somebody else. Wisdom is not acquired by reading a bunch of books. Wisdom is acquired by you taking the things you read in those books and putting it into practice and seeing it works. Make sense? Okay. Last slide. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. You know, we have to trust that God is the one who's steering our life if we've given him our life. Luke 23, 44 to 46 says, Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole earth until the ninth hour. And then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands... I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. It's the last thing Jesus said. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And that is an example for us. I don't know what you're going through. I, I know what some of you are going through. The best thing for any of us is to commit our spirit to God as our faithful creator. And trust that he knows what he's doing in our lives. It's not that he's mad at you. It's not he's trying to hurt you. It's not the, you know, the celestial magnifying glass and he's trying to burn you up. He's trying to train us so that we have something to give to somebody else. Make sense? Okay. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and let's pray. Father... After reading passages like this, it's hard for us to remember when we leave that the hardships and afflictions and difficulties that you bring into our lives are there for a purpose. 
I pray that you give us a heart that seeks that purpose. That we wouldn't just be so myopic and self-centered on ourselves that we mourn. But Lord, that we would cry out to you and find you to be faithful in everything. Lord, I just want to rededicate my life to you and put myself in your hands. That Lord, whatever happens from this moment on, that I would look to you and hold on tight. That you might be a blessing to each one of us, Lord. And that as we go through this life with you, that you might reveal more of yourself, more of your wisdom, that you would give us more strength, and that your spirit might enable us to do your will. Pray that you might help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.